All right, well then, uh, this morning we are continuing our sermon series on the Gospel of Matthew, and the title of the message this morning is, Lest We Should Offend. Lest We Should Offend. You know, we, as a church, and we, as individual Christians, need to be focused on our priorities and refuse to do anything or say anything that interferes with our mission. Amen? All right, and so um, keep that in mind as we study God's Word this morning and see what He has to share with us. So please uh, turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We're going to pick up where we left off by God's grace last week. <clears throat> they might wonder, well, to refuse to do anything that interferes with our mission, but what is our mission? Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Okay, we're going to pick up with verse 22. Everyone there? Okay. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. Verse 24, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children, children free, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take, and give unto them for me and thee. Amen. Um, if I told you that Rob and I went out fishing as we sometimes do, and we caught a fish with a coin in his mouth, you'd say, get out of here, All right? Uh, but this is what happened because God made it so. So let's break this down and see what the Lord is teaching us this morning. First, we have the tax collector that comes calling, right? When the tax collector comes what, uh, calling, what do you do? Well, usually you pay the tax, right? Unless um, you can show that you actually don't owe it, you pay the tax. So let's see what happens when the tax collector comes calling on the Lord Jesus. Verse 24, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. So the, uh, the Lord and his disciples uh, were at Capernaum, and Capernaum was one of the centers for collecting taxes. And so he and his disciples show up, and so do the tax collectors. And they approach Peter and ask him, well, does Jesus pay the temple tax? Now, please keep in mind that this was not the Roman civil tax collected uh, from people each year you know, for the government. Uh, this was a religious tax that the Jews paid each year for the upkeep of the temple, right? Every Jewish male between the ages of 20 and 50 were to pay this tax. And the Jewish males represented the community in, representing, in presenting the tax before the Lord, okay? So they paid it, but it represented everyone. So we first learn about this tax in Exodus, actually. God instructs Moses to take a census of Israel in the wilderness. So in Exodus chapter 30, up on the screen here, verse 16, 
And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Okay? So then in the book of Nehemiah, we learn that it eventually became an annual tax. Right? In Nehemiah, right? In Nehemiah uh, chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, for the set feast and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. Okay, so, so now there are two things in particular, though, that, you, that we need to know about this tax. The amount of the tax and the purpose of the tax. Okay, so notice I put in your bulletin, unlike most taxes, when it came to the temple tax, everyone paid the same amount. Everyone did. And the tax was roughly equal to two days' wages, okay? So about two days, typical two days' wage was this tax. Uh, and so with this temple tax, everyone paid the same amount. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, everyone paid the same amount. And then there's the purpose for the tax. The monetary purpose was to do you know, the upkeep for the temple, right? But then I put this in your bulletin. But there was a spiritual purpose too. The Bible tells us that this was a ransom tax. It represented, I put in your bulletin, an offering making atonement for your life. This is why everyone paid the same amount. The rich were not to pay more. The poor were not to pay less because everyone's life was worth the same. And that's what I put in your bulletin. One person's life is not more valuable than another's. And so that's one of the reasons why we need to see people as souls. You know, you strip everything else away. And we're all just souls. So you hear people say, well, did you know you have a soul? No, you are a soul. You have a body, right? Every soul is of equal value. So the temple tax was a memorial for, for the Lord, a reminder of the Jewish people that they owed their very lives to the Lord and that they needed to make atonement for their sins. And that was represented by the sacrificial system of the temple. Okay, so that's the first part. Then what we see, point two in your bulletin, the sons are exempt. Look at verse 20, uh, second part of verse 25. So the Lord gives us many parable about kings and taxes here and sons. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? So either somehow the Lord overheard it or he knew what was going on without having to hear it. Why? Because he's God. Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. So I put in your bulletin, The kings don't pay taxes, right? They collect taxes from others. So the Lord asked Peter, Well, what do you think? Uh, who do the kings collect taxes from? Themselves or from others? Well, it's from others, from strangers. Kings don't pay taxes, they collect them. And that's especially true when you're the king of the universe. Does God have to pay taxes? Of course not. What's he going to do, give it to himself? Right? He already owns it all. Look at Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's. Yeah, we like to think it's ours, don't we? 
You know, this is my property right here. Uh Uh-huh, sure it is. It's God's. It's God's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And then God tells Job, Job this. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Is mine. So kings don't pay taxes. They collect them from others. So what does that mean? That also means then that the king's sons are exempt, right? The king doesn't pay taxes. um, Neither does the family members. So look what I put in your belt. Well, who is the king in this scenario? Well, we're talking about the temple, right? So who's the king of the temple? God. And who is his son? The Lord Jesus. There you go. And you remember when the Lord was just a 12-year-old boy and, and Mary and Joseph were wondering, where is he? We lost him, right? Where did he go? And where did they find him? In the temple. Yeah, in the temple preaching, right? Yeah, and look what he says in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So he knew that God the Father is his father, and he knew that the temple was his father's, and that he must be about his father's business in the temple. The Lord Jesus is the Son of God. He is tax exempt. And the Son of God is under no obligation to pay the temple tax. So the bottom line is this. The Lord Jesus owed nothing. Keep that in mind. The Lord Jesus owed nothing. Okay, you with me so far? All right. Now, the third point. The fish with a coin in his mouth. By the way, as a coin collector, I'd love to have that coin. <laughs> yeah, imagine, imagine that. Verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. So remember, they're asking, the tax collectors are asking, hey, uh, does Jesus pay the tax? And Jesus didn't have to pay the tax, did he? But notice what he, and, and so notice what he tells, the Lord tells Peter. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take and give unto them for me and thee. Now, there are two important lessons to learn from this, uh, this final verse of ours today. First, refuse to make unnecessary offense. Okay, this is a very important point. Refuse to make unnecessary, cause any unnecessary offense. So, since the Lord was exempt from giving the tax because of his father's house, you would think he would have said, well, Peter, go right back out there and tell them he doesn't owe it. Of course, the Lord had the right to say that. If this were just some ordinary king who was doing this, the sons would say that, wouldn't they? Instead, what does the Lord say? Lest we should offend them. So he's under no obligation to pay the tax, but he does anyway. Why? Because he doesn't want them offended. And that's another biblical lesson to learn principle. As Christians, we should not cause unnecessary offense. Now, as Christians, Sometimes when we share the gospel, someone gets offended, right? The word gospel means good news. That's what the word means. But most of the lost word 
does not see the gospel as good news. They don't see it that way at all. They get offended when we tell them that there is only one way to heaven, and that is the Lord Jesus. They get offended when we tell them that the wages of sin is death, but that God has a free gift for them. And all they have to do to accept it is to believe on the Lord Jesus. Trust what he did on the cross as full payment for their sins. That's all they have to do. But they're offended by it. They're offended by the gospel. Because for many it's offensive because they think it shouldn't be that easy. Right? Or they'll say things, I remember clearly, my son Aldo and I were knocking on the door uh, up on Marin Heights. Do you know for sure when you die you're going to heaven? Uh, no, I don't. Would you like to know? And so he, he was gracious enough to give us about 30 seconds. And, uh, and so I said, yeah, sure. So we started sharing the gospel with him. And he said, are you telling me that if Hitler uh, accepted uh, the Lord Jesus, um, you know, believed on the Lord Jesus right before he died, he would go to heaven too? We said, absolutely. And he said, well, I don't want to be anywhere where Hitler could be. I said, well, uh, it, if with that attitude, it's likely you will be where Hitler is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, so there you go. You want to know how to avoid that? Keep listening. Or they'll say something like, what? Well, there has to be more than one way. You know, what about the Muslims? Or what about, you know, and it's, so they don't want to hear it. Oh, they'll get to thinking, well, my loved ones didn't believe this. And if what he's saying is true, what does that mean for my loved ones? So I better not believe it either. Get away with me with that stuff. You know, it's kind of like someone who's seeing that their, their parents are drowning and they, th and they could swim to the shore. They can't save them. They could swim to the shore, but they decide to drown right along with them see this a lot it's not fair that it's only one way there's only one way so I put this in your bulletin the gospel is offensive to many people but we need to share it with them regardless that's what we would call necessary offense that's necessary when we share the gospel we hope that they will be accepting of it it's likely to offend them in the sense that it's contrary to what they believe, right? Um, so we want them offended in that sense, but we also want them to accept it. But I also put this, as believers, our, our number one priority is to honor the Lord. And at the top of the list in terms of how we honor him is to share the gospel, Really? So let me tell you, folks, as a pastor, I'm very aware of the fact that I need to be blameless. I can assure you I am in no way sinless. If I had to be sinless to be a pastor, or if anyone did, you'd be looking at an empty space right here. Okay? No one could be a pastor if you had to be sinless but I'm aware that I need to be blameless. I need to stay away from any appearance of evil. Why? Because if I do something scandalous, then the focus will be on me and not the gospel. Right? My witness and my words will not be believed because it appears to them that I do not believe those words. Now, let me tell you, folks, if somehow I lost my mind and I somehow talked myself into cheating on my dear wife, I can assure you that I would still believe the gospel. I would just have done something very sinful. You see? I would have done something very wrong. But what might you all 
and the rest of the world think? He must not believe what he preaches, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have done this. Can you believe something and still act contrary to it? You can. Does the world think that? No. See my point? No. So, so that's, you know, pastors are called upon to be blameless, right? But here's the thing. The average Christian thinks, well, I have more latitude, you see, than a pastor does. But you don't. No, you don't. Your priority is to share the gospel too. So you need to be just as careful as I am. Otherwise, your witness will suffer. Amen? Amen. You will lose credibility. So the Lord could have refused to pay the tax because he didn't know it. But he paid it for the gospel's sake. So I put this in your bulletin. If people are unnecessarily offended, then their focus will be, uh, will be on being offended and not on eventually hearing your gospel presentation. You see? You know, so we go knocking on doors. And uh, we are, um, let's say we're Steeler fans, right? We go knocking on doors. And someone has a Cleveland's Brown banner out on their front porch. We knock on their door and they say, hello. Uh, and we say, um, uh, Boy, your team really stinks, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, right? Now, yeah, right. Now, do you think they're going to hear the gospel from that point on? <laughs> Ripping their flag. <laughs> yeah. You see my point? Now, keep this in mind. You, and many of you have heard me say this many times, but our thoughts cause our feelings and behaviors. Okay? Not people and things and situations and events. God created us so that it is our thinking that causes our feelings and behaviors. And thank God for that. Because otherwise, our emotions and behaviors would be dictated by our circumstances, by other people. Okay. So I put this in your bulletin, though. With that said... If we know that people are likely to upset themselves when we speak optional things for the sake of the gospel, we need to stay away from talking about those optional things that then they will take off with in their mind and not hear the gospel. All of you are familiar with the name Michael Jordan, right? Michael Jordan, the famous basketball player, I think the best basketball player ever. But now I might have just offended some of you who think, <laughs> uh, what's his name is? Um, but uh, what's his name? I'm sorry? Le yeah, LeBron James. Yeah, I just couldn't. I, I really wasn't trying to. I just couldn't remember his name. Uh, those of you who think LeBron is um, uh, might, might differ with me on that. But anyhow, Michael Jordan sold a lot of tennis shoes, didn't he? Or at least Nike did. Air Jordans, remember that? I don't know, do they, they still sell those? Do they? Kids still want them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. When asked, someone one time asked him, Hey, Michael, why don't you ever speak out on political things? And he famously said, Republicans buy sneakers too. Yeah, Republicans buy, so I don't want to offend half the people in this country, you know, who buy sneakers too. So if you are a conservative, as a Christian, your motto needs to be, liberals need the gospel too. You see? That's what, our, or vice versa. If you're a liberal, then, then you need to think that about conservatives. They need the gospel too. But if we speak unnecessary, and, and those of you who are, have been Facebook friends of mine, maybe for a long time, might have noticed that I rarely post political things anymore. I used to, but not anymore. By, the God's, by God's grace, I came to the conclusion that my priority is not Washington, D.C., 
It's not on who's in the White House. It's not on unnecessary political speech. So what's the point in inviting someone on Facebook, for example, into a social media political debate? What's the point of it? I can tell you what the point is. Hard feelings. Uh, people unfriending you, blocking you, and all that stuff, right? And a lost opportunity, therefore, to do what? Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Now, does the Bible prohibit political speech on Facebook or anywhere else? Not that I can tell of. Tell, uh, you know, not that I can see. However, we're guided by some principles here. Look at 1 Corinthians 10.23. All things are lawful for me. As believers, the law will not send us to hell. Right? The law does not have that power on us as believers. So all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All, in other words, all things will not help. Right? Will not profit us in terms of what we're trying to do to achieve what we're trying to achieve. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify or build up not. So sure, I might be, uh, uh, you know, uh, allowed to do this. There's no prohibition against this. But will it help the cause? Will it build people up? How about Ephesians 4.29? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that may minister grace unto the hearers. So you know what we're talking about, folks? We're talking about Christian liberty here. And I put this in your bulletin. Christian liberty is found in the Bible in several concepts. And so the first is this. Liberty for the Christian can mean that he or she has been freed from the penalty of sin by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the first way this can mean. For example, in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You notice what that says there? It doesn't say set you free. It says make you free. If someone is set free, what could always happen? You could be, you're right. But if you are made free, what does that mean? You are free, period, always. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered and said, We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And then we have Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So that's one way you can think about Christian liberty. A second I put in your bulletin is Christian liberty can refer to being freed from the power of sin in one's life by daily faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of one's character and conduct. So, so in other words, um, um, what, what you're doing, that's just a fancy way of saying, uh, I am uh, I'm going to read your word, and by the power of the Holy Ghost that you placed in me, I am going to live it out. You know, I'm going to obey you. Look at Romans, because why? Because before we were slaves to sin, now that we're saved, we're no longer slaves. Sin does not have that power on us anymore. <clears throat> Romans 6, 5, and 6. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There's a difference between sinning because we're still in this body and yeah, someone uh, said something mean to you and you told them off and then you thought, oh, why did I do that? As opposed to serving sin. Doesn't serving sin sound like an enduring, this is my attitude? Then we have Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. All right, so that's the second way. The third way is this. Christian liberty, I put this in your book, can mean that Christians are freed from the Jewish law of Moses in that the law only exposes sin in one's life, but cannot forgive it. Okay, Romans 3, 20 to 22. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you know what that verse 20 essentially says? You can't save yourself. Right? You can't save yourself by trying to obey the law. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe there is no difference. Okay? All right. So the law, uh, you're trying to keep the law to, to get to heaven isn't going to happen. But finally, the fourth way, and the, what we're focusing on is this. I put this in your bulletin. Christian liberty can mean that Christians are freed in respect to such activities that is not expressly forbidden in the Bible. Therefore, one can feel free to engage in such activity as long as it doesn't stumble or offend another Christian. Now, let's look at this. Romans 14. One of the most important verses related to this is Romans 14, verses 12 through 17. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Remember the issue of eating meat, uh, you know, offered to idols was, was going on. Here. That there is nothing un unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. But let then your good be evil spoken thereof. Let not your, let me read that again. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken thereof. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So most of the activities that we're talking about here are the social do's and don'ts, such as whether to wear certain clothes or not, or wear makeup or not, or jewelry or not, or have tattoos or not, or piercings or not, or practicing such things as smoking, or not, or social drinking, or not, or recreational gambling, or not, or dancing, or watching movies, or videos. Many things that the Bible does not directly say, you're allowed to do this, or not allowed to do this. But as Romans 14 says, they may not be directly prohibited, but they might be bad for your spiritual growth, your Christian testimony, and can cause others to stumble. 
And that is the most important part. Let me wait till the kids come. Okay. All right. Terrific. So now, <clears throat> so in those areas, so you're thinking about doing something, right? And you're wondering to yourself, well, I wonder if this is going, yeah, I mean, I'm allowed to do this. It doesn't say you can't. But I don't know if I ought to. Well, well uh, the first thing we need to do is look in the Bible to make sure we're right that it doesn't say you can't. Because if it says it's forbidden, then you got to stay away from it. But if it doesn't say that, then we need to pray, Lord, is this something that you would have me to do? Could it cause somebody that I know that's around me to stumble? Could it be a stumbling block in terms of their getting saved, you know, uh, or what have you? Could it be a hindrance to my serving you and and um, people hearing the gospel. Look at Galatians 5.13. Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. But isn't that what people do? Yeah, they do the opposite, don't they? Oh, you mean the Bible, the Bible sa doesn't say you can't do this? Oh, goody. That means I get to have this fun or that fun or whatever. It's saying use your liberty to serve others. What a concept, huh? I, I've given this example many times and you'll probably hear me give it more. Uh, but you will not see me. That, so, so what does the Bible prohibit? Drunkenness. Does the Bible prohibit all drinking? No. The Bible prohibits drunkenness. But if Sandy took a picture of me with a beer, like this, right? And I posted it on Facebook. There's Pastor Aldo with the beer. I know. Um, it's for good cholesterol purposes. Um, you know, it, it, like this, right? What might people who think Christians, you know, not people who aren't believers, who think Christians aren't supposed to drink anything at all think? What might they think? That, yeah, what kind of Christian is he, right? Even though they're wrong, that could be a stumbling block for them. And therefore, I knock on the door. Hey, aren't you the goomer that had the, you know, the beer in his hand? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see my point? So stay away from anything. Any that could appear to, you know, that would be a stumbling block to others. That could hurt our efforts. Yes, Lord, I know that I could, you know, take a picture and do this and do that. But look, do I care about the people getting saved? Or do I only care about myself and couldn't care less whether or not people go to hell? Okay. All right, then point B, and then we're going to wrap things up, and we have communion uh, uh, this morning, and then um, our, our meal afterwards. Point B, receive God's gracious provision through Christ. So look at verse 27 again, please. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast in hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. So look, here's the bottom line. Before we were saved, we owed God for our sins, right? Again, let me show you. For the wages of sin is death. That's pretty clear. 
So how did the Lord make payment for our sins? How did he pay the ransom tax? By giving his own life for us as a ransom. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a what? Ransom, ransom for many. So just as the Lord paid the full tax for, for himself and, and for Peter, you know, that day he paid the full price for us by dying on the cross for us. And his payment covers us. So like I said, when we were unbelievers, we owed God payment for our sins. But you accept God's free gift of salvation by trusting what he did you're accepting his payment for your sins. And then you're adopted in the family of God. You're free in Christ, but refuse to use your freedom for yourself or to offend others. We need to live as servants of God. Amen? Amen. You know, so, so let's... let's do our very best to avoid having anything come out of our mouth that would distract from our, you know, um, our teaching and, and our, our leading people to Christ. We're to love people, are we not? But we're also to keep our focus, our mission, the gospel. As a believer, you want to lead people to Christ, or you should want that. And then you need to refuse to do anything that stands in your way. But you know what? People will say, but I don't know how. I don't know how to share the gospel. Or I don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel. And if you think that way, that needs to grieve you. That needs to grieve you. If someone collapsed from a heart attack right there, and you could have learned CPR, but you never did. And there he is dying, and there's not a thing you can do for him because you didn't take CPR, and he died. How would you feel? Yeah. Pretty bad, wouldn't you? Yeah. Pretty bad, wouldn't you? But people think, well, okay, well, I don't know how to share the gospel, and they just leave it at that. Now, if a person doesn't have the capacity to learn it, then what do they need to do? Go along with those who are. Pray for them. Support them. You see? But most people have the capacity to learn that. And that's what we need to do. You know? Because, let me tell you, that dying on the floor is nothing. And we're talking about eternity. Amen? All right.